Without further ado, I will pass on the screen and the mic and everything else to Nils Christian Hansen, uh, Assistant Professor at IAS and associated also with Center for Music in the Brain, who has been running all sorts of interesting projects with uh, IMC in the past, but let's hear more about music for social convergence in times of spatial distancing. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. Um, I'm very excited to, to share um, lots of stuff with you today. So I've, I've prepared approximately, um, it's it's close to 30 minutes presentation, um, but you know, if you, if you feel you need to to stop me early on, just uh, just do that and then hopefully we'll, we'll still have a couple of minutes for, for questions. Um, I will go to screen sharing um, and so what do I do? I think I do this. Um, and my problem now is that I, I can't see any of you, but uh, so I expect that if if you don't see my slides, if the sound is not working or if anything else is wrong, then uh, then you uh, you should definitely let me know. Um, you, you can fix it, Christian, if, in this question, if you want to, if you click the more option I, uh, on top of your screen and then you can oh. pick the side by side view, then I think you can see us more or something like that. There's an option there. So as more mm. or show chat that there's there's some option there uh, under the more. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't see it. I think I'll just go ahead with this and then uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I'll just first hide uh, this one. Okay, great, good. So move on <laughs> to the actual content today. Um, so yeah, my talk is called Music for Social Convergence in Times of Spatial Distancing, and hopefully you'll, you'll figure out um, why that is. Um, so I, I want to first take you back to the to uh, March um, uh, last year, the historical time when, when suddenly um, from one day to the other, we, we suddenly had to uh, uh, learn about flattening curves. We, we saw from uh, pictures from, from China of, you know, large temporary hospitals. We saw the, the trucks in Northern Italy carrying dead bodies, people in their hospitals, um, lots of Im negative emotions and la later on uprising about um, um, uh, lockdown restrictions. And we also had our own uh, mink crisis here. So lo lo lots of negative emotions happening. At the same time, uh, if you looked at the social media landscape, you, you saw people making music from, from uh, bal balconies in Italy and Spain. As we saw, we saw healthcare professionals uh, dancing and singing first in uh, Iran and later on all around the world. Um, uh, th there were virtual choirs and virtual ensembles. There, there were governments releasing these uh, hand washing videos. You probably know this famous one from uh, from Vietnam that were that people were, were were dancing to and so on. So so lots of new musical phenomena happening. And of course, this is something that you can study scientifically. If you if you move to our um, own uh, home country, Denmark. Um, uh, a relatively unknown person, Philip Faber, choir conductor for the for the Diaz uh, Girls Choir, suddenly became a celebrity uh, for hosting morning singing on television every day, and this later developed into a to a Friday night primetime television program called Fellesang Verfosai, which was the uh, which has had the the highest viewership of any Danish TV program for six weeks straight, with about one point. 1 million viewers every week, which is a lot for a small country. And interestingly, when, when suddenly other programs took over, they were Ville uh, Vidonali, Denmark, and Grænseland, which were all other nostalgic nationalistic television about either nature or, or history. So there, there was a lot of focus on a Danish national identity during this time. And the politicians picked up on this. Um, this is, for instance, our, 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 our prime minister. So, so Danish Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen really understood how to capitalize on, on, on this phenomenon. Her, her Instagram followership rose to 400,000 during this time, which covers about 20% of, of young Danes. So she's really connecting to, um, to the population in, in these ways. Um, some people have argued that one of the reasons why Denmark fared relatively well during the first lockdown uh, was our trust in the government, our 
uh, cohesion, our our confidence in the healthcare system. And so it, it doesn't seem completely far out to to um, question yourself whether whether the the music making uh, might have played a role in this in this um, in this process. Um, because we we know from from various uh, uh, theorizing on the adaptive functions of music that that music um, some have claimed is a is a co-evolved system for social bonding. Uh, that's the reason the um, behavioral and brain sciences uh, target set of target articles on this issue actually. And then Peter and Keller and I also have a commentary in in that where we argue about the role of oxytocin in in all of this. But that's something for another time. Um, uh, there's also the social sur surrogacy theory, which is the, the idea that listening to music uh, feels like having company. So when you listen to music, it feels like other people are around and that might help you uh, for individual coping. So we know that music is good for emotion regulation, stress, re stress reduction, distraction, focus, um, hedonic pleasure, but also um, eudaimonia um, has been shown. Um, so, so back to back to uh, re real life, back to uh, March, where we were uh, had had a seed funding call on the third of April, and we were lucky with this application, uh, which involved two projects. The first one uh, was a project together with Meditab Hoibi, where where we were planning on on doing qualitative analysis on on these. Um, um, uh, diary entries in this study from the uh, National Museum of, of Denmark, where people were writing about the lock time, uh, uh, lock, lockdown period. It's, it turned out to be a bit harder to get access to this than, than we thought, and the corpus was also a lot smaller than we initially thought. So it, it didn't quite work out the way that we had hoped. Um, so that uh, places us, us with the second main project here, which was together with international collaborators where I was planning an international survey study, a crowdsourced database on Corona music and, and some, some web scraping projects that we'll, we'll try to summarize here today. So um, I'll briefly go over kind of some anecdotes about the, the birth of music COVID research, uh, some recent findings in the area. Um, and then I will introduce the, the two main studies, which was a multi-country survey study and a Corona music database. And then I'll briefly discuss some future research plans at the end. Good, so um, so what happened back then? Well, we, we were lo lots of music researchers around the world who started talking to each other on Twitter and discussing what how, how could we do the do research on this ph phenomenon. And then, then this turned into weekly Friday meetings uh, where we discussed different options and, and a step by step different groups uh, um, uh, materialized. And one of the things that we established was a global research network called eventually Music COVID, which now has about 400 members from 250 universities, companies, organizations in 45 countries worldwide. And we have representation from all six inhabited uh, continents, which is very exciting. It's not something we see at our typical international conferences. So that's, that's great news. Um, this was co-founded by me and uh, Professor Melanie wald fuhrmann from the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt. Um, and why did we do this? Well, we, we saw that lots of groups were coming together to, to essentially tackle the same research question. So all running big international surveys to figure out, are people listening more to music and, and, and why are they doing that? So it seems like we were all doing the same thing. So we really argued that we should, should go together in a larger groups of people and uh, you know, get this out of the way so that we could move on to the more interesting research questions about underlying mechanisms and things like that. Um, and of course, by doing so, we, we wanted to improve the scientific quality. And when you do that, you also get a lot better at solving the societal challenges, which is one of our tasks as researchers. So um, on our website, we have a cur curated list of ongoing projects. Uh, we release regular newsletters where we advertise events, so like conferences, publications, funding uh, opportunities and other resources relating to music and COVID. Good, and, and when we released this network, we did so at, at two virtual events on the 19th of May um, and at, at different times of the day to accommodate uh, all around the world uh, where we had um, about 21 international speakers and, and more than 250 at attendees. And th this was one of the initiatives to, to make each other aware of what was going on so that we could collaborate and make sure that we weren't all doing the same thing. 
Good. And I also proposed host hosting this research topic with Frontiers, Social Convergence in Times of Spatial Distancing, the Role of Music During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So you might rec recognize some of the title there. Um, it's uh, co-hosted by Frontiers in Psychology, Neuroscience and Sociology. Um, and one of the exciting things here was that the article processing charges were waived for uh, throughout 2020, uh, which, which meant that we, we could get contributions both from uh, all countries around the world and also from um, it, disciplines that don't normally have, uh, have the funds to, uh, to publish in Frontiers, uh, which is quite exciting. I think uh, we've received about 60 submissions so far and all, already have 28 published articles and they're, they're growing every week. Um, a lot of work and all that, I have to say, but it, also a lot of fun. Um, and we, we have some of the leading figures in music psychology, cognition, neuroscience, mu music therapy, musicology, and so on. So we, we are kind of also uniting a lot of different disciplines here, which is, which is, has, has, has been really quite exciting. And then finally, I also want to make, mention very quickly that we had a symposium accepted for the International Conference on Music Perception and Cognition and the um, Conference of the European Society for the Cognitive Sciences and Music, where we're trying to, to report back from some of these projects. So we have three of the large uh, international survey studies. We have an interesting Spotify stu a study on nostalgia, some more musicological analysis of, of Corona music in Germany, and, and then our project on positive effective bias in, in social media um, as well. Good. So, um, of course, being, being one of the uh, world leading experts in Corona music, I've, I've had the, the pleasure to, to talk to a lot of different news media during all of this, and national media in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Netherlands. And just the other day, I discovered we were covered by Forbes magazine as well. Um, so, so this has, of course, been a lot of fun, but of course, it's, it's a bit, um, um, unsatisfying that the media interests were, were, you know, that there was a lot of media interest about this, but we didn't have really any, um, substantial research results yet. So it, it was very much a lot of me speculating on different things and, uh, and talking about different initiatives. So of course, we hope now that we finally have results that the media will be interested in talking to us again. Um, good. So, so what can we say about mental health and well-being during the pandemic so far? Well, um, as all of you know, there, there are lots of review studies already out there showing very clearly that, you know, depression went up, anxiety, um, anger, people suffered from sleep disorder, suicidal behavior, uh, and so on. So that, that's very well documented. Um, and people also showed po post trump trump traumatic stress, uh, which could result from, you know, the financial loss, fear of being infected, guilt, uncertainty, social stigma, and so on. Um, and this, of course, relates to the general public, but the people who actually suffered from the, from the, from the disease um, also show some further neurotropic effects. So um, uh, this is an important aspect of the whole crisis is the mental health and well-being. And some, some of the aggravating factors here is being young, being female, having negative coping styles, different chronic uh, comorbidities, comor uh, being single, separated, divorced, having low education levels, uh, being excessively exposed to COVID news and having low confidence in, in, in the health system, being a healthcare profession yourself, coming in contact with patients and having limited access to um, protective equipments. Um, and of course, during this uh, lockdown, the governments were, for very good reasons, busy with dealing with the actual health crisis, um, you know, of, uh, getting rid of the virus. And that, that left uh, individual coping, or left coping very, very much an, a matter to the individuals. So the individuals had to, had to seek up um, a coping uh, strategies themselves. And one of the things we saw that is that people engaged with artistic, creative, activities. And this very nice uh, study by, by, by Market House shows that they fall broadly into four categories. So digital arts and writing, crafts, reading for pleasure, and then music. And we see that there's a tendency for people who are young, more highly educated, socially supported, but also more, more worried about infection uh, to engage in these um, activities over others. Um, Good. So that, of course, creates, um, places music in an important position. Um, so here, here's just a timeline over the, the calendar year of 2020, just to see where, where we are and where the phenomenon falls. So uh, first, all the small lines here are the um, 
uh, stringency in the indices for for 186 different countries from from this Oxford government response tracker. Um, so so we and and then the the dashed line is kind of the average across all of these. So we see that although there were some early travel restrictions uh, restrictions in February, most of the surge happens in in March around the time of the pandemic declaration. And then importantly, it kind of stays quite high throughout all of 2020. And this will of course continue if we if we if we looked at at the current year um when we then think about the corona music phenomenon um if we look at for instance google trends for music and corona we see that that's more uh, restricted to the to the actual time when restrictions went up and uh, and the pandemic was declared whereas that kind of uh, tapered off again later on um and while the restrictions stayed in place the corona music interest went uh, went went down it seems so we need we really need to focus on this time um when it comes to mental health unfortunately we don't have that much longitudinal data that kind of captures the the beginning of the phenomenon but we have for instance from a uh, daisy fan fan codes group from 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 ucl we have you know this very nice uh, data showing that depression was in the mild depression range on average and it's it went down a bit as the restrictions eased over last uh, north hemisphere summer but you know they still stayed high quite high and are probably still above normal levels um so these are the this you know just to get a sense of the year of the year as a whole um good so let's review some some music covid research so th this is going to be a bit backwards because uh, this will present be presented as a uh, background information for the studies that I will present. But of course, when when we designed our studies, we didn't we didn't know all of this, so it 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 kind of becomes a reverse order, you could say. Um, uh, this review is based on a on a, a review chapter that I'm writing with um, Elvia Pratico uh, called "The Music for um, Eudaimonia During Pandemic Social Isolation." Good. So first looking at, at objective streaming data from Spotify, uh, for instance, there's this interesting study where you have, you see plotted here in blue, uh, the, the development over 2019 and in orange here, the development in streaming uh, in, uh, in uh, 2020 and the pandemic declaration here, you see it, it decreases a lot. So, so Spotify streaming went down by a lot after the pandemic declaration. And if you look at individual uh, countries, you see that there's a lot of var variation here. In Denmark, it kind of stayed the same. In the Philippines, it really went down by a lot. And um, um, so, so th this is interesting here that it, it can actually be mapped very directly to uh, mobility patterns and more specifically commuting. So as commuting went down, uh, uh, Spotify streaming also went down. And in countries like Denmark, where you have relatively short commuting times, that didn't happen as much as it did in, in the Philippines, where you have uh, longer commuting times, for instance. Um, it also associates very well with lockdown restrictions and COVID cases, but not COVID deaths. Um, Nils, Nils? Yeah. Um, uh, just a very small thing. I think you have a drop down menu or something open in PowerPoint or the Zoom. Yeah. Oh, okay, that, that so, is your face. Is, yeah, great. I'll put this so square. It's just covering this slightly. Some yeah. Of the yeah, thanks. Sorry, did, did that help or? Yep. That's okay, good. super. Great. All right. So what, what happened very interesting at the same time was that YouTube streaming went up. So I, unfortunately, I don't have a summary figure for all countries, but you see Denmark and the Philippines, uh, YouTube streaming was relatively high. So it seems like people were migrating from, from audio streaming to video streaming, which is interesting. Um, so what happens if we ask people individually? Well, um, there's now a lot of studies that all converge on this idea that, that listening increased during pandemic lockdown. Um, so if you ask people themselves, they say they listen more to music during lockdown. Um, some studies report no to little change, um, but most of the studies report increases. And you see here, the green are increases, the blue are decreases for most of the musical activities. You saw an increase. Um, and but here it's of course, of course important to say that there are similar increases for many other domestic activities. So when people spend more time at home, they they just engage in these activities more. You could say. Um, very interesting, at least in Australia, people report that singing, dancing and listening to music are some of the very, very best ways of coping uh, with uh, stress. Um, but singing and dancing were also some of the activities that people had to cease 
because of the lockdown. So, so that left you kind of with music listening as, as a very important coping uh, mechanism that you could engage in even when you were in lockdown. Um, so, so that kind of raises the question, you know, so, so, so Spotify and streaming went down, but people report listening more. So are there some uh, qualitative differences in the way that people listen? So is there something about, do you listen more attentively? Do you have other motivations for doing it? Does it become more meaningful to you? Are there some interesting indiv individual differences here and how does it affect uh, music selection behavior? So that, those are some of the questions that we uh, addressed in our uh, first study here, where we tried to look at how did people's musical behaviors, uh, changes in their musical behaviors predict socio-emotional coping during the lockdown. So we conducted this uh, large scale study. We collected representative samples from France, Germany, Italy, uh, India, uh, the UK and New York, about 5,000 uh, respondents once we cleaned all the, all the noisy data. Um, and they were collected quite early on during the lockdown compared to some of the other survey studies. So in April and May, primarily mid-April to mid-May. Um, um, and uh, so, 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 so we had this survey which collected basic demographics, info on people's lockdown lives, the listening formats and situations, but also changes in their, in their functions or motivations for making music and for listening to music and some open-ended questions on which songs that people listen to, and some uh, questionnaires about musicianship, personality, health and well-being, and so on. Um, we pre-processed pre the data and then discovered this, this very interesting thing, which is an acquiescence bias, which is well established in the lit literature. So we saw that our Indian respondents were just a lot more positive about everything, um, and that's that's a phenomenon that you know that that doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that they are happier as a whole, but you know they they have have a different response behavior when they're contacted by researchers. And um, so to to deal with these uh, cross cultural differences, you could say uh, we 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 use ranking within countries uh, a lot in this analysis. And um, so first we conducted this exploratory factor analysis uh, with on all our fifty one variables. Um, we, we, it kind of grouped into negative emotions, positive emotions, and age factor, living situation, employment, city type, and so on. Um, but for the main analysis, we, we used um, a light gradient booster uh, machine regressor models, which is a, is a non-linear uh, modeling um, method that has gained traction uh, since it was introduced four years ago, uh, where we then try to predict social emotional coping with all our, our variables. Um, so let's look at first some descriptives here. Um, so first, domestic activities, as I mentioned before, you see the, the, the uh, vertical line here, everything that's to the right of that increased and everything to the left decreased. So most activities increased. Um, but what's interesting here is, of course, that listening to music and making music were some of the things that increased the most. So above listening to music, you have basic things like, you know, cleaning and cooking, which you have to do, uh, watching the news, which is also quite important, calling people and so on. And then you have watching movie and TV series, which is also something people did a lot. But music is up there um, somewhere, at least. Um, so when people listen to music, they tended to do it alone at home, obviously not too surprising. And um, same for making music, they tend, tended to sing at home uh, alone and, and not so much together with other people. So not too um, uh, surprising, maybe. Good. Uh, changes in motivations for engaging with, uh, with music. So there's a lot of information here. We can come back to the details later on if you have questions. But the, the kind of the, the summary here is that we see quite similar patterns um, for, for making music and for listening to music. And that, that is that, that people, um, people's motivations change most for these hedonic features like, you know, music being enjoyable, re relaxation, energizing, stress, anxiety re re reduction, and so on. Um, so it, it seems like, you know, people's motivations for engaging with music really changed and changed a lot in the, in the kind of hedonic um, uh, motivations. Um, good. So looking at the main analysis with the predictors of motivational change. So, so um, the, these are SHAP values. So, so on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, you see how much each of these individual variables um, 
how, how much impact they had on the model output in an additive way. Um, and the, the color here is then the feature value. Uh, there are individual data points for each person in the survey. So, so the, the factors that are important here are the ones that are separated, but also the ones that are separated in terms of, of uh, color, red and, and blue. Um, and one of the interesting things here that is that interest in other people's corona music behavior was, was clearly the strongest predictor of, of uh, um, social emotional coping with music. So, so this repertoire seems to have a spe special significance to these people. Um, we also saw that people who experienced negative emotions were more likely to use music for solitary emotional re regulation, whereas people who experienced positive emotions were more likely to, to use music as a proxy for social interaction. So here you have these you know, social surrogacy and emotional coping and, and, and yeah, showing themselves. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, these patterns were quite similar between music listening and music making. There, there are some important differences, but, but mostly they were quite similar. Good. So what do we know about pandemic coping so far? Well, from our study and other studies, we know that at least half of the population engaged uh, with music for coping. And uh, music was often rated as the most effective activity for achieving well-being goals. And sometimes it, it outperforms things like watching TV, movies and so on, reading, exercise, sleep even sometimes. Um, and what we see is, for instance, that, that young people find music more effective, people with musical training find music uh, more effective, but what really drives us it is people's uh, perceived importance of music. So the more important music is for you, the more, uh, the better it, it helps you cope with the, with the lockdown. And as, so there are some interesting correlations here as well. We see that life's uh, satisfaction correlates positively with music listening, but it correlates negatively with, with watching uh, TV, so watching TV series and movies. Um, and also psychological distress correlates negatively with listening during the lockdown, but doesn't correlate with listening before the lockdown. So it seems, you know, these are all associations, but it seems like there's something going on here. Um, and this, this effect was fully mediated by individual reward sensitivity. Good. In terms of selecting music, we know that people who were influenced a lot by, by the lockdown uh, typically listen to softer, more low energy acoustic music. Um, escapism is the theme that, that comes up. So we see that about one quarter to one half explored new styles and artists. Uh, nostalgia comes up a lot, uh, not, not only in the news media who want to talk about it all the time, but also in the actual data. Um, we see that about, you know, if two thirds uh, self-report nostalgic listening. There's this interesting study with this, uh, 17 trillion Spotify plays that shows that, that, you know, operationalizing nostalgia as songs that are older than three years, we see an increase in uh, nostalgic music listening, um, which peaks about 80 days after lockdown. Um, and there were these um, synchronous listening parties on Twitter, for instance, hundreds of them where people were listening to old albums together. Um, specifically for Corona music, we see that, that more than half developed this moderate to extreme interest in Corona music. Most Israelis listen to Corona music. Many Spaniards uh, participated in Corona music by singing from balconies and so on. And people's consumption of live streaming uh, also increased. Good. So that le leads us to kind of the second study here, which was a crowdsourced a database of Corona music. So, so already back in late March last year, I released first a Google sheet and then a survey, exact survey where people could submit a good examples of links to uh, YouTube videos and other things, uh, media um, uh, articles that talked about music as well um, during lockdown. And we, we then supplemented this with retrospective sampling. So we made sure that we had at least five videos per day during the early times of the lockdown by uh, doing Google searches on the YouTube web website, um, geolocated to USA, UK, Denmark, Italy, Australia, which together with Israel were the ones that were most prominently featured in our database already. So we're kind of reproducing the cultural bias that we already have in our database. Um, so it is culturally biased. There's no getting around that, but, but we increase the size of this database. Um, 
good. We then did dual coding, so two coders uh, with conflict resolution afterwards using this coding scheme that we developed, where we record both basic information about the, the URL, the social media platform title, publication date, country, the, the language of the lyrics, but also these binary variables on is it is it joint music making? Does it have movement, health info, conflicts? Is it original COVID songs? And does it contain original COVID lyrics? And then we have these more open-ended codings of setting, genre, emotion, uh, whether it was a professional music maker and various features. Um, so first, briefly looking at representation. So here's the curve from before. The red curve here is the um, Corona music interest. So we see that we cover with our um, database supplemented with retrospective sampling, we cover the main period of the Corona music interest, you can say, both in terms of videos and in terms of media uh, articles. Um, it's a relatively small database, um, but still. And we also cover different countries with a, with a huge overrepresentation of the uh, US, UK, Italy, Denmark, Israel, Australia, but we do have a representation from all around the world. Um, you can access our data on GitHub and OSF. And you can also access this very nice shiny app that we put um, that we made where you can explore the different variables um, on your own and explore, you know, break it down by countries and regions and things like that. So feel free to have a look at that. Good. So looking at some of the descriptives here, um, you know, not, surpri uh, not so surprising, togetherness was a very important emotion being moved, you know, um, as you probably experienced and heard about in the news media. But, and there was maybe a tendency for the news media to overrepresent togetherness compared to how much it featured in the actual videos. But that, of course, requires further testing. Um, we also saw the very positive emotions like happiness, humor were, were very common. Um, more so in the in the videos than in the media. Maybe you know humor and positive emotion is not so much a conflict uh, topic. So that's interesting for the media maybe. And not surprisingly, people made a lot of music at home, not so much at at studios and venues and so on. Um, but interestingly, perhaps a balcony uh, performances were were perhaps not as common as as they are portrayed sometimes in the media. Which I think is an interesting observation. Um, we see professionals engaged, but also a lot of amateurs engaged. Um, not surprisingly, English was a common language and the musical genres follow very closely the, the typical genres that people normally listen to. So Corona music uses the genres that we already know, but you know it adds new lyrics, new uh, features and skews the emotions in a more positive direction and so on. Um, yeah. Good. So just quickly, I want to mention a few ongoing projects. Um, uh, first of all, Co Co Corona Music Data Repository, which is an international funding application that we're working on. Um, Musica Co Coronavirus, which is a large database of more than six, uh, 1,600 uh, video, uh, Corona music videos from the Latin America, collected by Dan Magulis from Virginia Wesleyan University. But we are um, trying to maybe write a data report on this as well. Um, different review articles uh, or chapters that I'm working on, the one I mentioned before. And I've also been asked to write an afterword from this book volume on sounds of the pandemic um, that will be coming out next year. Um, and then finally, some social media research, which is our next IMC uh, seed funding project that we're working on right now with um, Rebecca Balini and, and others. And I just quickly mention here, we see, for instance, that um, sentiment in musical tweets seems to be more positive than sentiment in general tweets during, uh, during the crisis. And uh, we see with uh, um, acoustic valence, which is an acoustic factor feature you can get out of the, the, the Spotify API, we see that valence is higher in COVID-19 playlists than it is in a large control corpus. And these tend to fall into two distinct clusters, one low energy, low valence, chill acoustic uh, cluster and a more high energy, high valence party cluster. Um, so yes, so we're cur currently exploring YouTube comments, YouTube lyrics, Reddit, um, and a large news corpus as well. So just finally thanking our funders and our my collaborators on the survey study, which were Lauren Fink and Melanie Wald-Fuhrmann from the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, 
Claire Howlin from uh, University College Dublin, Lindsay Warrenberg from Sunday Health, which is a company in Boston, and Will Random from, from Uvascular. And collaborators on the Corona Music Data Project were Melvin Trider, Dana Swarbrick, and John, John, Jenna Wiskowski from the Ritmo Center uh, in Oslo, uh, Josh Bamford from Oxford University, and uh, um, Joanna Wilson from Uvascular as well. And I'm working with Elvia here on the Literature Review, and we're currently working on the social media research with uh, Re Re Rebecca Ballini, Anita Kurm. Uh, we were helped by Sarah Colling, Louis Yu later on, and we're now getting help from Ola and Malon and Lasse Damgo. So thank you very much. And this is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Nitz Christian. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful instance of how, uh, you know, a seed can grow into a forest or a seed can be part of a forest. An amazing timing that you took of this and so many interesting results coming out of it. So we have time for at least one question, maybe two questions. And there are so many of us out here that I can't see us all on the screen. So please just raise your hand in the Zoom window. Uh, Carsten, you are first. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Nils. Great work. It's very fascinating and impressive. Just a very quick question. So you mentioned there was a, a, a contrast to TV watching where live satisfaction was going down, which was a nice contrast, but uh, perhaps you already mentioned it, but what about um, other contrasts that are also um, audio, like audio books or podcasts and radio and that kind of stuff? Um, mm. Did you uh, have any chance to sort of reflect your findings in comparison to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've just been re reviewing all of the Corona music uh, research, so I can say quite, quite confidently that I don't think anyone really you know, separated between uh, podcasts uh, and like audiobooks and then like music or um, versus watching news and TV. So that that's definitely something that that would be interesting to look at. Also, um, with respect to this eudaimonic uh, dimension, you know, I think a lot of people have been using post podcasts. So that's definitely something uh, that someone should look into. And may maybe there's research already out there. I, I, haven't come across it, but I've also been mostly in the musical uh, arena, you could say. Yeah. Okay, 